program this week, we're going to be talking about real estate. We're going to have a wee look at a vineyard that's for sale and also what's the value in what's happening, what's selling and what isn't. We've also got a lot of other stuff for you, including cropping, because Dennis Carter will be in to talk to us. I guess the major thing this week, as far as what people are talking about, is those that have been honoured in the Queen's birthday honours. Chris Kelly has been honoured with a New Zealand Order of Merit. He's now an officer of that order. And that was because of the work he did with Land Corp. He picked it up when it was worth half a billion dollars and basically took it through to 1.6 billion. Other people who were honoured was Mark, uh, Mark Greenwood, International Biosecurity, Bob Berry for the Whitestone Cheeses and what he did with them, Dr Gary Nixon for Rural Health, Andy Stevenson for Aerial Top Dressing and Mervyn Utting for his work that he's done with dog trials. Sheep rustling is back on everybody's conversation list again with a whole lot of merinos, very expensive merinos I understand disappearing in the Marlborough district and people still can't work out including the police how it happened or where they have gone. There's more safety apps as the rules and regulations have changed as far as hazards on farms are concerned and frosts have started to hit the country which is making a lot of horticulturalists and cropping people very very happy. The dairy industry is still holding out and it hasn't been a raft of banks putting a whole lot of people into liquidation, which is very good. But also, as we'll hear very shortly, no doubt about making sure that you, you check your stock values. Oh, and there's a few problems arising now about selling natural milk at the gate for profit and not being processed. Really? Problems about that? In just a moment, we'll be talking farm accounting. <music> Kerry, now, you as an accountant, chartered accountant, always say keep your receipts, but what's this move towards paperless ones? Yeah, we had an um, announcement over the last couple of weeks from uh, Paymark, who's one of the biggest FPOS providers in New Zealand. They've come out and said they've developed a um, service now where you can actually have a paperless receipt. So instead of going, say, to the petrol station, filling out the 40 bucks worth of gas and getting a receipt that you've got to put on the farm mute or whatever, um, you can subscribe to their service and you get a digital copy of it. So you don't have to worry about finding out where it is. It's just straight onto a device or into the cloud. So <laughs> you, that's the end of those sort of paper receipts. It's got to be $50 or under, but it's a huge innovation. $50 and it's going to, or under. It's going to make a lot of uh, admin time disappear for people. So was, do you use it on the phone or had it? Yeah, there's, it's a um, special sort of subscription type service that's based around your phone, digital device, that sort of thing. Um, there's a monthly cost, but it's an outstanding service for those that you know who have a lot of miscellaneous receipts that they never find. Right. It's going to help you as a chartered accountant. Oh, it's going to make our life a lot easier because we're going to then say to them, have you got such such receipt? And they're going to go over, look on that date or even under the name and find it. So there's no more hassle of trying to go through the farm mute and say where did I put it and <laughs> yeah you know, and the, and who was doing your book we're trying to find it as well. It's all going to be there in one place. And of course, the easier it is for you, the less you charge. Yeah, it is, and the cheaper the farmer, and you know, makes everyone happy. Exactly. Now, speaking of of slave labour, <laughs> <laughs> children working on a farm. I mean, I used I used to get board and lodgings at the school holidays <laughs> yes, from working on the farm. It's that time of year again when people are sort of saying, "Look, we want to put our children on the farm. They want to use it as an income splitting type measure, so they figure that you know they're going to make a bit of money. Hopefully, um, let's give some to the kids, and we can use them on a sort of ten and a half um, percent tax rate rather than the seventeen and a half or thirty three. The reality is, it's not quite that simple. Okay. Um, if you're going to use your children on the farm, you've got to treat them as if they're an arm's length type person. Yeah. So you've got to pay them what's fair. You can't go over the top. So if you said, you know, they're going to do a couple of hours a week and you pay them, you know, a thousand bucks for two hours work, um, that's going to be a no-no. IRD can actually come back and say, look, that's not um, Well, they'd kosher. have to pay tax on that, anyway. Yeah, well, the, the, the children have to pay tax on it. But, um, you know, so IRD can actually reallocate it back to the parents as their income. So you've got to yeah, you've got to be realistic about what you can pay them. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. So no, there's that. Don't don't push the system. No, but people to try because yeah, they think oh, they, it's a lot of tax saving from ten and a half to seven and a half, or even thirty three if you're the top rate. Yeah. So they figure that they can uh, work the system to their advantage. It's not that simple. And then of course, if you do employ your children, 
you've still got the health and safety to comply with. Oh gosh, I didn't and, think of that. And you've got employment agreements, so you've got sick leave, holiday pay, and all <laughs> those sort of, and you've got to document it. So it's not as simple as just you know, putting a payment through for them and paying the PAY to ID. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, the modern child is probably right up to all of that as well. Yeah, you'll be, <laughs> Excuse yeah. me, I'm not going to be feeding the chooks or milk in the car because I'm on holiday. Yes, well, I, yeah, I hope there's some reason where they said their kids refused to do a certain thing because it was below them, because you know, according to the, what they their friends were doing, they should be doing other type of work. So they're fairly well skilled up on it. And they know what the pay rates should be as well by talking to their mates. So you can't sort of underpay them either. Yeah, well, I think my system where, where the stepfather person said, you, you, we've got a roof over your head and we feed you a couple of times a day. That's it. Yeah, that sounds really fair. <laughs> yes. well, I didn't think it was fair at all. No, but, but it's, uh, it would keep you out of trouble with ID, though, if you're yeah. trying to get too carried yeah, away. It did, it did, indeed. Faster tax returns. Yeah, um, there's been some legislation put through Parliament recently, the um, Tax Simplification Bill. There are a lot of sort of things in it, but one of the key things is it's going to possibly make tax returns faster. At the moment, some of your sort of more old-fashioned accountants will do your tax return, they send you out the tax return to sign, you've got to sign it and send it back to them. Um, that will eventually disappear because we've got the ability now to have um, e-signatures. So you can actually just get an electronic copy of a document, you sign that document, and yep. then you, you send it scan it back. and send it No, back. no, it's not even scanning it. It's straight within the document, there's ability to actually just sign that document and send it back. So you don't have to print it out, scan, email or anything like that. Um, so it should mean you can get a tax return filed within 24 hours, rather than waiting you know, five plus days while you wait for the farmer to sign it and send it back. Mm, mm. So it's going to make life a lot easier for, for those accountants that aren't quite up to it, or the clients who can't be bothered signing paperwork when it arrives in the mail. They can just get an email. Well, you sort of put it on the kitchen table and then you put the... Exactly. Can be farming magazine on top of that, and there's something else goes on top yep. of that. Whereas this will come in on you know, electronics, so it'll either be in the cloud or on email. You sign that document by just filling in a couple of things on it, and you send it straight back to the accountant, and that's the end of it. With all due respect, you've lost me. I still use a fountain pen when I'm not in the studio. But are farmers keeping up with all this? Oh, yeah. Yep. Farmers are moving quite fast. We've got quite a few that use an iPad to manage their farm. Um, they won't use pen and paper, so a couple of them will come to our office and they just sit there with their iPads, all their notes and everything, and when they want to take notes, they just type it straight into it. So they're, they're fairly progressive, and they're pushing us hard to do other things electronically for them, um, whereas some of the other software providers that we use aren't quite there, mm -hmm. but the farmers are demanding it. I mean, for example, your, your TriTech, which I think is an absolutely fabulous system because you can monitor where you are the whole yep. way through. You're still doing... A hard copy of that, or was that all electronic as well? We can do both. So we've oh, got right. some where they get the electronic and some where they get the hard, or it just depends on what they want to do. Some people still like to sort of have that hard copy so they can sort of tuck their receipts into each month that we do for them. Mm. That and brings me right back to the fact that you still really have to keep an eye on budgets and on growth and income and spending. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. There's no time to relax. You've got to yeah, monitor it very closely. In fact, I had someone in last week where we sat down and redid their budget again because they had a change on the farm. And, and they realised that the budget they'd done wasn't quite up to scratch anymore. And so we, we get right in there. And, and you, you actually keep their feet on the ground rather than saying, this is what I'd hoped for, this is, this is what I expect. Yeah. yeah, we know what they've done in the past. So we, we got a bit of a trend on quite a few of ours. And so we can use that against what their budget is. And they're going well outside their trend. It's going to be like, hang on, you're not going to get there. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah, get back to where you should As be. As I said, keeping the feet hard exactly. on the ground, Kerry, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about real estate values. Andy, people traditionally think of Harcourts as city and town, as in real estate, but you guys are changing that. Yes, well, I've been brought on board along with a number of other guys to try and grow the uh, rural side of Harcourts business. Um, it's certainly very strong in the residential and commercial areas. Um, but uh, yeah, we're certainly gaining some traction and with a few of us with uh, sort of wider experience we bring to the table and uh, we're certainly growing our share. We're very strong in the lifestyle market and uh, increasingly uh, in the swine area, which I tend to specialise in and also further afield in some larger pastoral properties and a bit of dairy farming. And throughout the country or other parts of the country, we're quite strong in the dairy sector as well. Um, but yeah, we're certainly growing our share. What's selling and what's not? Um, well, I, I think lifestyle blocks always seem to be moving. There was obviously a flourish uh, post-earthquake and um, the various pockets of lifestyle uh, properties around outside Christchurch are, are always in demand, more or less, um, and people do move 
either grow to bigger properties or um, uh, you know want to move to a different district or whatever it is so they tend to change hands but they're still steadily in demand um, and um, there is quite a demand for uh, pastoral sheep and cattle properties although there's a shortage of supply so bigger demand than supply Dairy, of course, we're um, all sort of uh, biting our fingernails a wee bit at the moment um, with what's happening in the dairy sector, but we hope that uh, the prices improve quickly and that there isn't a, a rash of sales. I don't think that's going to help anybody uh, if that were to happen, so no one wants that to happen, so hopefully it won't. Yeah, but it is all cyclical, Andy. It is. It does tend to be that way. Uh, vineyards, uh, the wine industry is in strong heart nationally, um, obviously led by the biggest area, Marlborough, which just goes on and on like a big machine. Um, but the other regions as well, and Wiper is one of the smaller um, regions of New Zealand wine industry, but it's, it's certainly got its reputation, and this vintage in particular has been outstanding. Season's been great. Um, we had a bit of a scare in, in spring with a, a frost, which tickled a few people up and, and caused some grief to one or two. But generally speaking, everyone recovered, and the weather's been outstanding right through to harvest, which has been great. And um, accordingly, the quality of fruit and the quantity of fruit has been superb. So I think we'll see some outstanding wines coming out of Wiper this year, which will resurge its uh, interest for other people, I think. And let's take a look at the fact that you guys are specialising in rural because you do need to have a hell of a lot of knowledge about what you're doing. Certainly, and um, we're, we're looking to specialise in that area because um, there is a lot more going on in rural properties and I think often you find that even on the lifestyle blocks there are sort of idiosyncrasies of, of rural land, um, uh, water supply systems, boundaries, um, septic tank issues um, and various other factors that, that, are, that are quite different than the residential setup. So um, I think it is important that people know that are dealing in those know what they're doing, know what they're dealing with, and if further afield we go into more specialist farming operations, viticulture, dairy, sheep and cattle, um, then yes, you need to know what you're about. Very important to know what you're all about. We're going to be hearing more from Andy in just a moment or two. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture. Or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. about this property in Wiper. Well, this is uh, here at uh, Church Road in uh, Wiper, and it's uh, on some heavier of the soils found in Wiper. Um, the varieties planted here are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, ideally suited to the soil type and producing some outstanding wines which are exported to Australia and the US. Um, predominantly with only a small um, proportion sold in New Zealand. 
Um, they've got a great reputation. They've consistently performed well. The vineyards are very well established and very well managed. So it's one of the better ones in the valley um, and consistent performance. Um, all grafted plants, all on the correct good spacing and irrigated and frost protected. Uh, not the frost are major on this property, but there is a frost machine and it has come into its own. So yeah, it's it, all around. It's a, it's, it's a smaller property, it's 6.8 hectares, but it's an ideal block uh, with a beautiful villa which has been restored, um, which we see behind. And uh, they've also got a little um, b and uh, accommodation facility, which is in high demand. There's not a lot of accommodation in Waitra, so they tend to get inundated with inquiry, which keeps them busy as well. And it's an extra income. Very much so, yeah. It's, it, it certainly adds to the, to the wine side of things. So they have their own brand, obviously, from this property. Not everybody does that. But on smaller blocks, um, it tends to be the way to go for um, optimising profitability. Is there a fair bit of interest? There has been a lot of interest in this property. We, we haven't sold it as yet. Um, I think that the interest has been uh, either from people who have had no experience in grapes but love the idea of living on a vineyard and the villa, uh, but they get scared about the grape business, or it's the grape industry people who know the quality of this property and what it produces and uh, really just want the vineyard and not the house. So we, we've had the two extremes, but we have had a lot of people looking, but it just, we just haven't found the one that really wants both. And I guess it's ideal for somebody who wants to live in a beautiful area and not necessarily be hands-on as far as the vineyard is concerned. I, absolutely perfectly. That, that's exactly what we're looking for. Someone who would want to live here, maybe run the B&B business, but the vineyard um, can carry on supplying the existing brand. The, the, ven the owners, who, the vendors, are keen to do that. So it would suit someone who didn't want to, who didn't know about it, and didn't want to be involved in it. Um, it would be just quite a nice little investment. Lovely way of life. Yeah, excellent way of life. The envy of many. <laughs> Wonderful lifestyle, never the same. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about tanks, and I mean the ones without tracks. Phil, there's a lot more to the modern tank than meets the eye. Uh, absolutely, Rob. Um, yes, every year brings something different, doesn't it? We uh, uh, want to put a bit of a highlight on our, our tank range. Uh, we talk about colours. You can have a number of different colours. And then we've got a whole lot of, uh, a myriad of choices, as they would say, of uh, connections and accessories that we can use with uh, our tanks. So why do you need such a wide range of different couplings? Uh, because sometimes the climatic conditions don't work uh, in our advantage. Uh, for example, uh, in situations where it's very cold or it gets cold uh, during the winter months, which obviously is coming up soon, uh, we would want to stop, for instance, the filling of the tank from freezing. Uh, and we do that by a frost protection kit. And uh, what we do is we actually run the pipeline up the inside of the tank. Uh, and that then means that it doesn't get any colder than the water temperature in the tank, which for a 30,000 litre tank is going to take a lot of cold weather to cool that sufficiently for it to freeze. What about the indicators to let you know how much water or fluid is in the tank? Well, uh, in our new tank, uh, and in fact in our older um, 25,000 litre moulds, uh, we've got uh, positions where it's possible to mount tank indicators, um, and you've got a couple of manual versions which Essentially they have a ball float on the top of a stainless steel rod uh, and then as the tank uh, becomes more full uh, it rises uh, into the air so you can actually see that the tank is fully full or of course if it's sitting down at the tank you know that in fact uh, it's approaching empty or in fact empty. Is there an electronic version or anything like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, Smart Water have a very good unit uh, which mounts on the top of the tank, uh, has a, uh, a pressure sensor that actually sits in the tank uh, which gives you readings dynamically down to wherever the house is, so long as it's line of sight generally, um, and it will tell you exactly how full that tank is. And of course that's important when you've got uh, very expensive mobs of stock on properties, you really want to know that in fact they are sufficiently watered, because it's one of the issues of course. Now of course many of the tanks, because of gravity feed, are placed at the top of a hill. What about tying them down for high winds? Oh, absolutely, and you'll find in our big tanks that we've actually got uh, 
really good, strong tie-down points, uh, a number of them around the tank, where in fact you can tie them down to a, uh, a ground anchor of some sort, maybe made from a waratah or something like that, just to stop the tank moving. Um, and then, of course, you've got the option of a uh, what we would describe as a fire reserve, but effectively it um, means that the tank is never empty. Um, unless you've actually got a fire requirement. Uh, so it would still have a couple of tonnes of water sitting in the bottom of it, so they become immobile. Yeah, I was going to ask you about couplings for firefighting. Yes, absolutely, and there's a couple of versions of those uh, in 3 inch and 4 inch, uh, but it's possible to actually mount those onto all of our larger tanks, and all of these things we actually do in-house. So when you come to order your tank, I uh, just simply say, uh, look, I'd like uh, fire, uh, fire reserve on it, I'd like frost protection on it, um, all of these ancillaries, and it will be supplied as such. Now, I understand that you've also got tanks that are specially designed for colostrum and for wine. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I guess the wine's more interesting, but let's talk about the colostrum first. Uh, obviously, the first milk, you want to know uh, how much you've got, uh, so we produce those tanks in a, in a natural compound uh, which enables you to actually see dynamically the water level or the colostrum level in the tank. Uh, and they're, they're um, certain, certainly priced well in the market uh, for everybody. What about wine? And the wine, yes, um, well in fact they must have just had harvest and uh, they'll be thinking about the next harvest I guess now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, absolutely. We produce some, um, some tanks with thicker walls. Uh, we produce them with um, entries at the front, as you would normally have in a wine tank, uh, as well as um, capped um, tops uh, for those in stainless as well. So uh, we actually do quite a bit into the wine industry. Now, one would have thought that plastic, or whatever it is that you call it, would actually taint the wine. No, polyethylene actually is extraordinarily inert. Uh, it doesn't react particularly with most chemicals. Um, so you end up with a, a really superior product that's going to last for a very long time. Uh, and certainly in a wine sense, there's no taint. Uh, they've been used extensively overseas uh, for many years in the wine industry, and nobody's really taken any particular heed of it. Uh, and of course there are a small percentage of the price of stainless steel, which is of course very expensive. Of course you can also tie them, tie them down, can't you? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, you've got all sorts of options. And I mean, within that same range we produce chemical tanks too. So for industrial sites where they're wanting to store some acids or um, some bases or other things, uh, they'll be bunded with seismic restraints, so in fact they're bolted to the ground uh, and we use those same tie-downs to actually achieve that. So, I guess as I said, there's a lot more to the modern tank than beats the eye. Oh, absolutely, absolutely there is. Indeed there is. In just a moment or two we're going to be talking about mental health and we're going to be talking to Dennis Carter. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy, deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. 
to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at onthelandco.nz. Now you students at the Lincoln University, you're looking into mental health? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Rob. It's a big um, big problem within the industry at the moment and uh, we've just decided to take it on as a bit of a focus and uh, see what we can do to get the message out there a bit more about it. So what have you done? Uh, so we run a bit of a uh, workshop a couple of weeks back for rural professionals um, along with the team at FarmStrong. Uh, we got Dr Tom Holland in and uh, he just delivered about a two hour workshop um, to those professionals around how they can um, improve their mental well-being themselves, um, obviously they're exposed within the industry every day, um, so a big part of it was trying to get them um, more educated so that they can look after themselves better and then look after their clients a lot better as well. How are you going to get it out there? Um, so this is basically where we're starting from, is just trying to run small workshops like this, um, get the word out there a bit more, and then um, we're coming up with a bit of an on-farm initiative as well, just to spread the word a little more. There's a bit of on-farm experience? Uh, so we're starting up a, a group called the Handy Landies, um, which would basically just see us get out on farm and help those uh, in need, starting in Canterbury with about a two hour radius of the university here and um, giving them a hand where um, we can see best fit and they need it done. Now seriously, how do you get the word out to, to the farmers? Uh, so we've got a website, www.handylandies.co.nz, um, in which people can get onto and sign up. Um, obviously running that real professional night, they're speaking to their clients about it and it's starting to just build a bit of momentum through word of mouth um, and we've locked in some uh, some jobs out on the Banks Peninsula, um, North Canterbury over the next few weeks. As far as a continuation of trying to help the, the farming industry, what are you going to be doing? I guess that's where uh, we're continuing on now with it, is actually getting out on farm with it. Um, so it's not so much we're forcing it down people's throats at all, we're um, just out there to get a bit of a, a yarn with the farmer on the day and I think for them just having someone different on farm for two or three hours of the day makes a huge difference. Um, so that's sort of where we see it continuing and hopefully spreading throughout New Zealand. The mental health thing really is a big issue, isn't it? Yeah, it is a big, big problem within the industry. Um, we've been working very closely with uh, the North Canterbury Rural Support Trust and uh, they're telling us day by day cases that they have come to them and it genuinely is a, a big problem for the industry that's often sort of kept under the covers. And it's not just the person who's hand on on the farm, it's also all their family as well. Exactly, yeah. No, people commonly sort of get this perception that it's just the farmer themselves but um, it's awfully, often the farmer's wife and their families that are, are being put through this just as much. Um, they're exposed almost to the, to the worst side of the farmer when he comes home at the end of the day. So, yep, big problem there. It's interesting that you're helping the people who are helping the people, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was our big focus was these rural professionals. They're the ones that are um, out there every day with them. And for them, you know, being put in that environment every single day, you don't just simply come home and switch your mind off from it. Um, you don't drive out that farmer's gate and, and forget about their problems. So it's important that they are looking after themselves as well. What's the latest on Monsanto and Bayer? Well, Bayer have been talking to Monsanto and, and Monsanto said we want more money. Basically. Oh, really? Yeah, really. <laughs> Surprising. So, um, yes, um, Bayer have up their, up their offer by $17 billion. So they just found that from somewhere and uh, their offer is now $60 billion for Monsanto. But um, I see Monsanto has just been awarded uh, a, uh, a green environmental um, award for their company internationally. So that could be worth another billion, couldn't it, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how big the New Zealand economy is, but I think this particular deal is probably bigger, the entire, bigger than our entire economy. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Mm. Now, speaking of nasty crawlies and things, aphids. Yes, Rob, um, with our uh, warm autumn we've had, the, the aphid numbers have uh, multiplied extremely quickly, as you can imagine aphids do in, in, uh, in warm conditions. Oh, I remember you telling me that they can, they can be born pregnant. I mean, that's... Yes, alive and pregnant. Yes, exactly. Yes, so they're uh, they're very versatile little creatures, but certainly the levels have been extremely high. And um, 
uh, far do a baseline, do some trapping and do a baseline looking at uh, 2005 for one and then the average over the years. And 2005 was a very bad year for barley yellow dwarf virus in mm -hmm. wheat crops. And so our big concern this autumn is the numbers that have been out there, um, they will start to drop down as it gets cooler. Yeah, we've had a few frosts now. Yes, we have indeed, but they can live under snow. So they don't just die in frost, they, they, they just slow down. And um, things like wind and rain, they will really hammer the numbers. But farmers should be vigilant if their wheat has been up for quite a while and some of the uh, seed treatment that they've, um, insecticide they've put down with the seed will be running out of puff now. So they need to be looking on warm afternoons um, under the leaves of the wheat. And if there's aphid there, there's a real chance that they could be uh, injecting this um, virus uh, with their feeding process, barley yellow dwarf virus, which so can be quite them? devastating. So you spray them. Yep, yeah, you do okay. it. How's, how's stock grain? Because it, it's, it should be coming into its own. Well, grain for stock food, uh, specifically, Rob, um, it's cheap as chips at the moment. And it's it's high powered, and it and it's a uh, it's a great thing. It's concentrated, it's 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 dry and warm when the stock are eating it. You can imagine a um, cattle beast or something or sheep eating uh, a cold wet turnip. Mm. Well, that in itself um, cools the the temperature down of the body of the of the thing or animal that's eating it, and that takes energy to warm up. So, grain is dry, and warm, and concentrated, and easy to store and uh, easy to feed and um, they can it's very very high powered of course with, with the protein and the starch sugars uh, and fiber that's all in it um, and and it means that things like um, grass seed straw and barley straw can be added to something as powerful yeah, give it as a bit that of bulk. give it a, give it a bit of bulk just to fill them in and of course the the absolute energy that's required in in chomping and walking or chomping and they don't have to walk very far um, the the um, the chewing of, of uh, grass seed straw and barley takes energy in itself. So, not so much when you're getting a concentrated thing like barley or wheat in. So, it has plus plus plus, very few minuses. Yeah. And farmers should be really looking at at, uh, at grain at these sorts of prices. As with with a bit of straw in there, it makes it sort of sound like chaff. Well, it does, and, and uh, yeah, chaff with the, with the oats in it, mm. with quite a few oats in it. So, um, yeah. Um, Sounds good. Way to go. Seed for certification. Seed certification. Um, yesterday, actually, <laughs> was close off date for um, reed clovers and change of cultivar. And, and there's quite a few farmers that have been growing um, uh, overseas modification white clovers that just need to check if they're moving back to Huia, that becomes a change of cultivar. So the rules apply. But there's, there's quite a bit of um, white clover to be, to be grown this year by the look of it. And so uh, if you're going to change cultivars, your close off date was yesterday. If you hurry up, you might not get a fine or a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do it online these days with- um, Everything, you can do anything online apparently. Yeah, with, with the Seed Certification Bureau. And, and it's also closing for uh, turnips and rape at, uh, as it used to day. But they used to allow a delay for farmers to catch up. So. Um, if you're very, very quick and do it online, you may not get the penalty. Correct. Very, very briefly, we should look at spraying of clovers as well. You're spraying of clovers this time of the year and young clovers, looking at things like Preside, a very gentle spray with uh, quantum if there's uh, field pansy in there uh, is an ideal thing. Or if the, if the paddock's got hair grass, we need to be looking at um, curb and these cold, wet times of year. It's one of the best for taking out um, hair grass and things like Rumex, which is uh, sheep sorrel. Um, the best for yeah, that. And, and yeah. hit your lucerne as well. Yeah, look after your lucerne at this time. Take the grass weeds and flat weeds out of your lucerne and think about um, fertilising that, building it up, because um, if you're cutting the lucerne off the field, there's an enormous amount of nutrient goes with the lucerne off the field, and uh, they do tend to be overlooked in terms of um, uh, being fed with fertiliser, so look after them. Look after the lime as well. Exactly, Dennis, thank yep. you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to go back to the Lincoln University and what they're doing with these handy landy chaps and chapesses. Future Leader Scholarship, what is it? 
Yeah, so the uh, Future Leader Scholarship is a scholarship, both scholarship and a program uh, run here at, at Lincoln University and takes on a group of first year students and takes them um, through their time um, at university in, a, in what's a competitive scholarship and that doing, um, doing things both in the classroom and outside the campus and community uh, basically to earn, earn the scholarship and learn more about leadership. Now the Handy Landies came out of that. Yeah, so the six of us at the heart of the Handy Landies all found ourselves sitting around a table at the pub one night actually, where all good things start, and um, we just sort of got talking about what we wanted to do this year, and it all sort of snowballed from there really. What is it exactly, this hand, Handy Landy thing? Yeah, so from that, um, and what we were talking about, we were sitting around and talking about all the time was falling dairy price and start of another dry summer, and um, and a lot of the East and South Island and basically came to the conclusion that it wasn't just climatic or economic effects but there's always going to be people that needed a hand in our rural community. Um, so nutted it out and came up with the idea that we've got a, a heap of keen young students here at Lincoln um, that we could get together like minded and who are willing to give their time to get out and, and help people that, um, that might need it in the rural community. So and also a great chance for us to, to get out, get out, of, get out of the class and get some fresh air and um, you know, go fencing or milk cows or paint a shed and all that, uh, that sort of thing. So. How do you pick the, uh, the farmers? Well, we have a website set up now, Rob, so it's sort of much like an online dating sort of set up where we've got the labour your uh, resource and they need a job done, so they find us on there pretty much and they might type in what sort of jobs they need done and we we supply the labour resource and the barbecue and the beers afterwards and get the job done and yeah. It's all very voluntary so no cash changes hands? No, 100% um, voluntary and going back to the, the good old grassroots of just getting out there and, and lending a hand, really trying to promote the um, basically the positivity and the, and the proud farmer sort of image that you know, everyone chips in and, and help out whoever needs it. And this would help mentally as well, wouldn't it? For us. But, but, well, for both. Yeah, yeah, for both. So I suppose it's just as much about getting the job done as just having yarn and connecting with people that might be quite isolated on farm as well. And like, the cool thing about it is it's not confined to any one job. Like, it could be as diverse as baking a cake or lasagna for the wife or taking the kids to school or, yeah, just picking up where we can help out, really. And I guess with all your students, you've got a pretty wide range as far as experience is concerned and skills are concerned. Yeah, definitely. So um, what started is with the group of uh, the six of us and then expanded to sort of 50 odd. Uh, we've now gone campus wide um, and are actually affiliated club on campus. So out of the potential two and a half thousand people at Lincoln, we've definitely got a real wide, uh, wide skill set, which is great um, that A, we can offer you know, fencing, milking, whatever it may be on farm, but all sorts of opportunity for someone that doesn't know those things to come along with us and learn from the student side. So. And Georgie, it's a template, I guess, that can be placed anywhere around in New Zealand. Yeah, well, that's sort of our plan. So our short-term plan within the next six months is sort of to stay within to our radius of Lincoln and get our sort of concrete model set up here. But then from there, once we've got that sorted, it can be passed to any university or young farmers club or keen person anywhere around the country. And that same model can be copied there. And hopefully if we've got it as foolproof as we'd like, it should be pretty basic to yeah, translate that anywhere around the country. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting, but what's the uptake been like? Yeah, so so far um, we've completed our trial stage now and had um, two successful runs on farm and basically um, today it's just been through word of mouth and hopefully our rural professional evening is going to help with that but we've got three or four um, farms and days out lined up in the next month or so and it um, doesn't necessarily have to be used but it's a resource that's there um, that having it in the back of your mind that if one day you do need a hand that um, you can give the handy landies a call and, and we'll come out and do whatever it is that needs done. The tall poppy syndrome, people don't like to sort of put their hand up. We'd like to think we've sort of set it up in a way that it's not too intimidating to ask for a hand. Like um, hopefully the website isn't too confusing and it's pretty easy, pretty basic to say what you need and, and we thought it's a bit easier than asking for money or that sort of thing, like it's easier to ask for a hand than 
than cash, so hopefully we're a bit, bit more approachable as far as that goes. So in reality, the farmers are giving you a chance to get some on-farm experience. Yeah, definitely. It's a uh, two-way street that they get to have these, um, you know, us come out and essentially we're learning as well, but at the same time, you know, we're giving them a hand. So hopefully everyone gets something out of it and can sit down at the end of the day, have a cold, quiet beer and a barbecue and, you know, have a yarn and a catch-up as much as anything. So. Sounds like a great idea as far as I'm concerned. After the break, we're going to be talking about what you can do with a disused quarry. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at onthelandco.nz. And take a disused quarry and a whole lot of blood, sweat and topsoil and this is what you get. Yeah, yeah, it's taken quite a quite a number of years. Obviously it's taken a lot longer than than we were anticipating. It's just a long term sort of project. It's been um yeah, not dragging on, but um yeah, it has taken quite some time actually, yeah. Now the topsoil all had to come in by truck. Yeah, that was a whole whole process in itself. It was just one of those unique opportunities that sort of was there at the time and had to be made the most of, so, yeah. What on earth would make you want to, to convert a disused quarry into what you've got here now? Initially it was just a, a place to work and live that was sort of interesting and, and sort of a step away from the con conventional life, I suppose. And, um, yeah, and, and it sort of just grew, it became sort of evident that it was going to become more than I originally sort of thought it would. Um, there was a lot of interest in what we were doing up here and more people started to visit and yeah it just grew into to what it is now which is yeah, becoming quite an attraction actually. And it is now a destination? Mm, yeah we'll get, we get buses coming from all over the place, we, you know groups coming from Ashburton and car clubs and yeah all sorts of people from all walks of life make their way here and yeah really enjoy it. What are you about 50 minutes from Christchurch? Yep, yeah, yep yeah, that's the one yeah. Are you self-taught? Well, self-taught. I'm sure I have taught myself plenty of things, but you pick things up as you go from, you know, all people and, you know, all walks of life, you know, there's always something to learn from somebody and, and you know, there's been, um, you know, I have worked in, in engineering workshops in Christchurch and picked up tricks and, and bits from there and, and, you know, looked at other artists and, you know, all sorts of red books, all sorts of ways of, of learning. I, yeah, self-taught, yeah, I suppose. I haven't been to university, put it that way. <laughs> now, when you want to start building, creating or, or whatever, producing a bit, where do you start? Often one, one idea leads to another, but, um, yeah, sometimes it's just something very, very simple that um, 
but generally sort of sticks in the mind and it sort of just hangs around there and it just develops, it sort of nags away at you and then I guess actually creating something that represents that idea is kind of a way of getting it out of your system quite often, if that makes sense. Then of course there's your horse, now he, he's your big one. Yeah, that was that was probably the most challenging piece I've sort of undertaken. Um, both my wife and I have got a real fondness of heavy horses, Clydesdale and the likes, and we've owned many horses over the years, so sort of had to be done really, yeah. Now as far as commissions are concerned, do you work with people or do they come to you with a concept, a plan or an idea, or how does all that work? Most of the time we sort of work on things together. Um, generally people don't come and say, this is what I want, make this. Um, normally people are coming for sort of my design input and also ideas. Often there's someone that's got a space on their property or in their garden that they would like something and sometimes I just get that, that um, image emailed to me and, and have a think about it, have a discussion as to what type of you know, style of work they like because I do sort of very broad range of different styles of work which is actually quite handy when it comes to trying to find something suitable for somebody because they've all got different tastes and, and um, yeah, with a little bit of emailing to and fro and then sketching, you know, this and that, we normally arrive at something that the customer's, yeah, really thrilled with. So, yeah, that normally is how it works. Yeah. Now, you've got a huge range. You've got a lot of stuff that's obviously designed to rust and have that rust look. Then you've got those beautiful tulips, which are very, very clean. I love those. Oh, you're going to buy them? <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. I thought you might. Um, we'll, yep. we'll, we'll have a discussion <laughs> shortly. <laughs> well, um, yeah, there's, yeah, I, I use all, all different, uh, mainly, mainly work in steel and stainless steel, but yeah, recycled pieces sort of, um, recycling is sort of fairly dear to my heart. It's a little bit like, um, the story of the quarry itself is, is, is really just like a, a large scale recycling project. You know, it, was a, it was a piece of land that um, it wasn't chucked away, but it was it had sort of run its course and no one really wanted. And it was a bit of an eyesore and a bit of a dust bowl and, and we've actually taken it and sort of upcycled it, I guess, is probably a good way of putting it. So um, yeah, I like reusing pieces, but on the same token, there's also work that gets built out of brand new marine grade stainless steel that's really sort of high end, high hours work that's worth a lot of money. So yeah, there's a sort of two ends of the spectrum there, which is, um, yeah, which is good. Nice to have kept the original buildings from when it was a quarry. I absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, we don't want the, the place to sort of lose its soul as such. We've really, same thing again, we're just using that recycling philosophy, using what's here um, you know, I think that's got a lot to be said for it. Um, it wouldn't look right sort of building new stuff anyway, you know. So it's all part of the story and the history of the place. Yeah. I mean, the history must go back a fair way because it's been a pretty big hole. Yeah, 1938, I'm told it's, it was started and it finished sort of the early 90s was the last line that came out of it and was left sort of derelict for sort of five or so years until sort of I got my hands on it. So. Tell me, how did you find it? It was just a little ad in the Christchurch Press actually, it was just in my studio in Christchurch, sort of, yeah, looking at the, the press one morning and spied this little ad saying mortgagee sale, disused limestone quarry and, and yeah, the rest history really, yeah. <laughs> UK and EU, to be or not to be? Well, that is the question, yes, <laughs> uh, and it's the question they're going to have to answer on the 23rd of June, because the Prime Minister, uh, I think uh, probably going back to the point where he was trying to become leader of the party uh, and helpful, uh, helpfully appease the, uh, the, the, the very far right of his party, uh, promised a number of things, including, including um, a referendum and now the the day has arrived or very soon it will arrive and so Britain has to decide whether it is part of Europe um, as it has been militarily and economically and in every other way culturally for hundreds of years or whether it uh, cuts those ties and tries to establish some new kind of relationship with the European Union. Um, There's been a suggestion that perhaps they should walk away and, and actually reshape 
the Commonwealth and yes. trade deals with us a lot. Yeah, well, that, that would bring some benefit perhaps to uh, to New Zealand exporters, but uh, we've we've reoriented our trading relationship so brilliantly over the last forty plus years, uh, from a time when uh, ninety three percent of our exports went to the United Kingdom. Uh, to today where perhaps five to seven percent go there uh, and we've just transformed our relationships uh, so well. Um, do we want to unpick all of that? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's uh, the size of the market isn't it because the UK is not that big compared to the rest of the world. No well the UK is 60 plus million but Europe by itself is uh, well over 300, the United States is 300, China a billion. Um, uh, we never traded with China until uh, I first went into Parliament and we recognised the, the Beijing government and opened up all of, those, uh, all of those opportunities which we're benefiting from immensely as a country today. So uh, there's only so much that can be produced uh, and, and sold, um, but I suspect that the the economic argument in England and Britain will prevail. I hope it does, anyhow, um, because the the re the Remain people have clearly won the economic argument. Britain mm. will be poorer uh, by far if uh, if it decides to leave the union. It was trade-wise. I mean, we're, we're, are you scared about TPP if, if either the two leaders get into the presidency in the straight in the in the United States? Well, um, my preference would be for Clinton uh, because although she's um, critical of some aspects of the TPP, uh, I think that she'll work through those with uh, Congress, uh, whereas Trump seems to be uh, against it. You know, But Trump hasn't got, in my view, a very strong political background. He doesn't quite seem to understand all of the complications of shooting off at the lip, um, <laughs> as he has done from time to time. You know. 17 pound of field guns don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, he really is, isn't he? I mean, he but he seems to have come out and said, well, no, we just don't know all about that. Exactly, I mean, exactly, because he's trying to appeal to blue collar workers whose, um, whose, whose jobs might be uh, threatened by, uh, by freer trade. But, 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 but really, uh, freer trade, providing you've got safety mechanisms in there uh, for political sovereignty and all of that, freer trade does make everybody better off. Mm. Does the Congress and Senate over there actually guide? I mean, would he be, uh, can he be outvoted? Uh, yes, he could be, uh, although his own party has a clear majority in the House of Reps um, uh, and they pretty much gerrymander their seats. That's hard to see being changed. Uh, <coughs> the Senate, though, they are quite vulnerable there. I think they've got 24 of their senators up for re-election in, in November, and so it's possible there could be a change in the Senate and the Democrats could get back in control, but, um, but the, <laughs> which, which it's a complicated system. Yeah, uh, it is. Checks it is. and balances, and uh, not like here where, where our government can decide to, to do anything, it's, and, and there's not, not much in its way. Yeah, speaking of cans of fuel over a fire, yeah. changing the subject though, bit more locally, urban spreads a concern. Well it is. Uh, I, I think, uh, well both the major parties in Parliament have now um, kind of signalled that they want to see Auckland's urban boundary uh, scrapped. Um, I, I think that's regrettable actually because I think that unless we, until we come to terms with the fact that we cannot just keep on spreading our cities out over productive farmland forever, uh, we're going to be diminishing our, our productive base uh, and the cost of infrastructure, so, uh, building that for ever-expanding urban areas is also something which is generally left to the next generation. So at some point, some government is going to have to say, we need a new paradigm in housing, we need to have stronger uh, planning laws, we need to respect the, he the independence of hearing panels rather than try to intimidate them from, from off the side. And uh, I just think we need to, we, we, I mean, I, I was in England recently and I was so impressed. There you've got in England maybe 50 million people and yet when, you, when you're taking the train through the country, you've got all of this green area. I mean, mm. if that was New Zealand, there would be, <laughs> there would hardly be any green area left with our current mentality. Is it a case of Auckland as a big pool of voters? Well, it is, and there is a, there is a uh, for sure, Auckland will, will swing elections pretty much uh, alone, but uh, there are disputes within Auckland. Younger people tend to want apartment living because they think they'll be able to afford that. Uh, older people tend to want to keep their quarter acre or, or fifth of an acre. 
uh, or whatever. And so to appease the, 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 the demand for housing, uh, the easiest way always is just to say, oh, we'll just spread a bit more. And yeah, it's spread mind, a bit more and spread a bit more. It's the well, mindset, isn't it? It is, yeah, it it's is. like trying to get people in Christchurch to catch a bus. <laughs> but yeah, that's oh, another story. That's Kerry, another thank story. you very much indeed. Cheers. If you'd like to recap on what Kerry was saying or any of the other interviews or items on the programme, go to our website at sportontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you just missed the programme, but I will be back. And you can check it out on our website. Until the next time, bye now.